Hi, everyone. Good morning, and thank you for tuning in. I'm Becca Wasser, a fellow in the defense program and co-lead of the Gaming Lab here at the Center for New American Security. And we happen to be back today with the second Mission Brief event of the month. The Mission Brief speaker series features deep dive conversations with senior civilian and military leaders where we really delve into some of the critical issues that the U.S. military and defense uh, is, is going to face in the future more broadly. We tend to talk a little bit more about operations, force planning, and defense strategy. And the aim of this series is to really have um, those meaty, frank conversations about what the nation needs to do today in order to contend with future challenges and strengthen its ability to compete and fight in the future. And I'm excited to be joined today by Lieutenant General John Jensen, who happens to be the director of the Army National Guard. And we're going to be talking about, you guessed it, the future of the Army National Guard. Uh, General Jensen, thank you so much for being here today, and I'm really looking forward to this conversation. Thank you very much, Becca. It's great to be here, and I just really thank you and CNAS for the opportunity to come in and talk about the Army National Guard a little bit this morning. Great. So before we get into the good stuff, I want to talk a little bit about uh, the Mission Brief series and kind of rules of the road for the event today. Um, so all conversations in this series, they're public, they're on the record, and we're recording it. So as soon as this event is done, you're going to see the recording pop up on our website and on YouTube. And each session in the Mission Brief series has a very particular topic. And that happens to be the mission brief for the day. So today we're focusing on the future of the Army National Guard. Uh, we're going to talk about what the Army National Guard's role would be in future competition and conflict, what their missions would be, how future operations will impact readiness and drive some modernization priorities as well as force structure changes. Um, each event is going to kick off with our speaker talking about the mission brief for the day, and then we're going to go into the fun conversation. And the conversation is really going to get into a lot more detail about some of the challenges and the changes that are being made to be able to meet some of the future requirements. After the fun conversation, we're then going to shift to questions from the audience. And this is really your opportunity to ask critical questions and try and shape how senior leaders are thinking about the future. To submit your questions, please use the question and answer function uh, in the toolbar at the bottom of your screen. Um, alternatively, you can submit questions or comments on Twitter by us using hashtag CNAS2022. Um, I do want to point out that we will not be taking any anonymous questions, so if you want your questions to be asked, please use your name and that way we'll make sure to pull it up in the queue. So, Let's get into the good stuff and let's get started with the question of the day. General Jensen, what is today's mission brief? Rebecca, thank, thanks for that. And uh, I, again, I just thank you and CNAS for the opportunity to come talk about the unique contribution of the Army National Guard to our Army, to our nation, and to our states. Uh, and so what I'd like to start with really is what is the Army Guard uh, doing today? Today, uh, as of this morning, 41,600 Army National Guardsmen are currently uh, supporting operations globally, about evenly split between uh, domestically uh, and in, in our Title 10 status. Our domestic uh, role, Title 32, uh, federally funded under the control of the government or governor, state active duty under the uh, control of their governor, about 19,400 soldiers of the Army National Guard conducting a variety of missions, everything from COVID-19 response, substitute teaching uh, in schools uh, in New Mexico, uh, response to uh, recent winter storms and things like that. Uh, I'll just spend just a real quick uh, moment here to talk about COVID-19 uh, response because uh, obviously uh, it still remains very important to our, to our nation. What we see today is we're beginning to see a down uh, tick of Army National Guardsmen on Title 32 orders in support of their governor. Just kind of walk through this real quickly. In the uh, late spring, early summer of 2020, we kind of saw our peak of Army Guard support to uh, our governors. 
almost 40,000 Army National Guardsmen on orders in support of uh, COVID. That began to uh, wane over the course of the summer of 2020. And we were kind of pretty steady from uh, fall of 2020 into uh, the summer of 2021 of about 15,000 uh, soldiers uh, on duty. Uh, early December, we actually, uh, or December of 2021, we actually decreased bet uh, below the 10,000 mark, which was a, a very substantial moment for us as it relates to uh, COVID-19 support to our governors. But then shortly after that, we saw with uh, obviously with the increase of COVID cases across the country, uh, we began to grow back up, have gotten as high as 16,000 again, but now we start seeing that number uh, going down. So we're, we're very happy for that. Uh, as it relates to our Title 10 mission uh, globally and here in the United States, uh, about 22,200 soldiers currently uh, on duty. And that would incorporate uh, a variety of missions, everything from the National Capital uh, Integrated Air Defense Mission to K-4, Guantanamo Bay, uh, OIR, OSS, Horn of Africa, uh, and you know, on and on and on. So, uh, you know, we're we're at that 40,000 mark and we've been at that 40,000 mark uh, since I've, I've been the director here. Kind of a what I believe is a sustainable number for the uh, Army National Guard uh, going into the into the future. And speaking of the future, because I know that's what kind of our focus is today. What I tell everybody is, is when they ask about the future of the Army National Guard, you know, where are we heading? I always say you need to look back to the past first and foremost. The Army National Guard will remain the primary combat reserve of the United States Army and an available ready force for our governors to respond inside of the 50 states, three territories and the District of Columbia. That won't change. I don't see any change to that, that dual responsibility that the Army National Guard and the Air National Guard have to our states and to our nation. But as the Army enter, enters a very deliberate uh, modernization phase, the Army Guard will also modernize. The Army Chief of Staff, uh, General McConville, and the Secretary of the Army, Secretary Warmuth, have been very adamant that as our Army modern, modernizes the reserve component, the Army National Guard and the Army Reserve need to come along with our Army because it's the reserve component that really provides the United States Army, I believe, with its depth, its endurance, and its stamina. So as we look at, a, at the wide array of missions that the Army is accomplishing across the globe, the Army Reserve and the Army National Guard are right there with the United States Army. Our primary purpose in, in the Army National Guard is to fight our nation's wars and to secure the homeland as a lethal cost-effective operational force. It's this federal mission that the Army National Guard has that allows, it, uh, that allows us to respond to and execute the wide variety of missions we get inside of, of the United States here by our governors. Again, COVID-19 response, response to uh, natural disasters, weather related natural disasters, uh, on and on and on that, that we have done uh, over, the, over the course of the history of the Army National Guard. And it's that federal mission that allows us to organize, train, and equip uh, our force that makes us so uh, versatile. And Secretary of the Army Warmuth, I know she was uh, just a couple of weeks ago with CNAS and, and she talked about her six uh, objectives uh, in support of the three Army priorities of uh, people readiness and modernization. And the, and the first objective that the Secretary talked about uh, was putting the Army on a sustainable strategic path as we field cutting edge formations to conduct multi-domain operations while facing increased budgetary pressure. And I really think the Army National Guard allows the Army to do that. Uh, we provide 39% of the operational force to the United States Army at about 10% of the Army's budget. So you can see there's a great value proposition for the Army as it relates to what they spend on the Army Guard and the missions that we're able to uh, conduct uh, globally. And we're fully integrated into HQDA's G357 and Force Comms uh, new readiness model, the regionally aligned uh, readiness and modernization model, REARM. Uh, and it's really allowed us to put ourselves, COMPO one, two, and three, 
really on a chart and a path to where we can see all three compos out into the future as it relates to training, uh, mission lines, and modernization. And I think that that is very critical as we try to gain predictability for our soldiers and our units as it relates to the operational uh, op tempo. The, uh, the other item I'd like to talk just very quickly from the secretary's comments has to do with acquiring and retaining talent. Uh, it's no surprise to anybody who watches this. Uh, we have had a difficult uh, past couple of years as it relates to recruiting new soldiers and really new service members across the Department of Defense. That should be no surprise uh, in our COVID restricted environment that we've had. Now, the Army National Guard, we've been uh, we've been very healthy as it relates to our ability to meet our end strength mission as assigned by the United States Army. Uh, we've experienced lower attrition and higher retention during this time period, which has allowed us to maintain our end strength above uh, the actual the mission requirement. Now, how long is uh, how long is the lag in recruiting going to take place after we get out of COVID-19? That'll be the that'll be really the answer uh, that we'll need to provide, and we're looking very closely at at, at all of that, but. Uh, uh, no mistake about it. I, I have told the chief staff of the Army this. I believe that my first responsibility to the United States Army is to ensure that the Army Guard meets its end strength mission. Because from there, with full units, that allows us to move into personnel uh, readiness and then unit readiness. So, Becca, those are a couple of things I'm thinking about as it relates to, uh, you know, the Army Guard mission uh, this morning. I, I look forward to uh, the conversation uh, with you this morning and the questions from our audience. Thank you. Thank you so much for that. And so I wanna delve into some of those items that you talked about a little bit further. Let's start off with the Army National Guard's domestic requirements. You mentioned a lot of the missions that they've had to fulfill over the past two years. I'll just mention a few more. Um, we've also seen Guard forces perform law enforcement and crowd control functions during protests. Uh, we've seen them undertake missions at the border and uh, you know, more recent attempts to unionize down there. Uh, we've also seen guard forces deploy to protect the Capitol just down the street on January 6th. Um, you know, and more recently, we've even seen them act as substitute teachers in schools. That's a really wide range of domestic functions that the guard has been called upon to perform. Um, and it seems as though there's sort of this shift in mentality about how the guard is being used. It's kind of going from being the army's Swiss army knife, if you will, uh, to instead a quick fix button for domestic issues. So I wanna ask you about, as we're looking forward, how is it that you see uh, the Army National Guard being called to perform a variety of different domestic functions? You know, what is it that we can expect to see over the long term? Do you think that this is the operational tempo at home we should expect? Or do you think that it's going to lessen and that some of these, uh, you know, functions that the Guard has been called upon uh, won't be the case moving forward? Well, I'd like to believe that it's going to lessen primarily because at some point we're going to leave a COVID-19 environment. Uh, and so if you take that off our plate right now, that would reduce uh, our operational tempo uh, by a factor of about 15,000 soldiers a month that would be able to come off of that mission. And, and so I think, that's, uh, I think that's really important when we talk to leadership and when we talk to soldiers is that you know, we are in a one, once in a century uh, time period here. If you go back to the influenza of, of the early 1900s, you know, this, this does not happen uh, often. Uh, but we do know with climate change that we also have a, a higher rate of hurricanes in, in, in the Gulf and the Atlantic states. We have a higher rate of wildland fires uh, out west. As, as all of the climate change takes place. I would say primarily the biggest difference between those type of missions and COVID-19 is just the length. Traditionally, uh, we respond to an emergency, it's a short duration emergency, and then we'll return back uh, to our families and our employers. With COVID-19, what we've seen is just an enduring mission. Uh, we're, we're, we're now into the, into the third training year, training year 20, 
21 and now 22 have been impacted and affected by our COVID-19 response. So I think, uh, I think when we see the, uh, the end of COVID-19 support, uh, we will go back to more of a traditional role of responding to emer emergencies that are short duration. You know, I'm reminded of, of my father who served in the Iowa National Guard. And, and one, of the, one of the missions he did as, as a young soldier in a field artillery battalion was uh, assisting with delivering hay to livestock after a, a very severe winter storm where, uh, where the animals weren't, where the, weren't able to go from pasture to pasture. And so this is, this is nothing new for the Army National Guard. So uh, I think that the Army National Guard's domestic functions are a little bit more uh, well understood in part because I think for all of us in our communities, we've actually seen it in front of us. But the Army National Guard deploys overseas for overseas operations, uh, you know, quite a lot. And frankly, um, you know, in some of the work that I've done, I've come across, uh, you know, various guard units performing a range of different functions in places like Afghanistan, Iraq, Kuwait, you know, when I was out in the Middle East, uh, I believe, you know, the Task Force Spartan IBCT was a guard unit. Um, so, you know, with that, We've talked a little bit about where we think some of the domestic uh, functions are going to go, but what kind of overseas operations do you expect to see the guard support in the future? Yeah, I, in, in my opening comments, I, I talked a little bit about the uh, regionally aligned readiness and modernization model, rearm that that the army has here. And it's really, it, it, it's focused on, on meeting our global requirements by, while simultaneously planning for a deliberate modernization of our army and our active component army, quite frankly, is too small to do that by itself. And so the army guard and the army reserve are going to be part, we are part of the, uh, the rearm model uh, to, to allow all three compos to, to do that. So as you mentioned, uh, you know, involved in Southwest Asia, involved in, in Europe, uh, you know, really globally, uh, we're, we're involved in, and I don't see an end to that uh, in 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 the near term. Uh, the it looks as though we might have uh, a little bit of a Army National Guard. If you you talk to the senior, like the transition that took place uh, shortly after. So it looks as though we're having some technical difficulties uh, on General Jensen's uh, end. So if I wouldn't mind asking everyone just to be a little bit patient uh, as we sort this out. Okay, Becca, I, I can hear you. Are we back on? I can see you and I can hear you. Okay, so I'm going to assume that that... Uh... That, that, we're so, that we're good. So we've employed everything from our highest echelon unit division headquarters down to obviously, you know, individual augmentation, uh, platoons and, and, and companies. And so uh, I expect that to continue. Um, you know, just sort of a little bit more short term, uh, are you expecting to see any future deployments to Europe uh, on the horizon for guard forces as the United States uh, is trying uh, to manage the current crisis? And, uh, you know, uh, I think it changes by, uh, by the strategic, a lot of focus right now in, in Europe. Okay. Um, so I think we are totally back, but uh, let me ask you a, another overseas operations question. And I think it's one that you will probably like answering, which is what is the future of the state partnership program? You know, for me, it's sort of the hidden gem uh, when it comes down to security cooperation. And I think I can definitely see a world in which the state partnership program becomes more and more important, particularly as the Defense Department is moving forward with a new national defense strategy, which according to Dr. Mara Carlin in an earlier mission brief series, uh, she talked a lot about how the next NDS is going to focus on integrated deterrence and allies and partners are a cornerstone of the integrated deterrence concept. So you could imagine seeing the state partnership program growing a little bit. Could you talk a little bit more about that? 
Yeah, the state partnership program is a program uh, that we are very, very proud of uh, inside of the National Guard. And I'll just use very quickly my personal experience coming from the Minnesota National Guard and our relationship with Croatia and, and, and being able to watch that relationship grow over the course of over 20 years and, and really seeing it move from that initial military to military engagement to uh, to the University of Minnesota with the University of Zagreb, for example, the city of Zagreb with the city of St. Paul, and just really see these relationships and partnerships grow. But I, but I, think, uh, I think key to our national security strategy is exactly this, allies and partners. Uh, and, and that is an asymmetric threat or an asymmetric uh, advantage that we have over our competitors is our, our allies and, and partners. And so uh, over 85 partnerships globally, every combatant command to include NORTHCOM, believe it or not, there's an SPP uh, partnership uh, here in, North, in NORTHCOM between the Bahamas and Rhode Island. Uh, that's probably gotta be a pretty sweet uh, partnership uh, there. But currently uh, SOUTHCOM 24 partnerships, UCOM 23 partnerships, in Africa, we're partnered with 16 different nations, Indo-PACOM, uh, 13 partnerships, CENTCOM, eight partnerships. Where I think it's gonna go, it's gonna continue to grow. And, and as our strategic focus uh, continues to grow in Indo-PACOM, I think that's where we're gonna initially uh, see our, our, our advancement and our growth uh, to, to go. But it is, a, it is an amazing partnership. I had the opportunity for about a year and a half to serve at U.S. Army Africa, and, and I would go down on the continent quite frequently. And as soon as uh, the U.S. ambassador to whatever country uh, I was visiting found out that a National Guard general officer was there, the ambassador would always want to talk about state partnership and, and how their country could become part of uh, the state partnership program. So we're very proud of that, uh, that program and what it provides our nation. So I want to talk a little bit more about some of the readiness parts that you had pointed out in your opening comments. Uh, so, you know, and please correct me if I'm wrong, but um, I believe the Army National Guard currently follows a five-year deployment cycle. And from what I hear in discussions with friends who are part of the National Guard, it's one of those things that really sounds good on paper, uh, but is truly difficult to execute well because of some of the additional domestic responsibilities placed on the Guard, uh, coupled with a lack of training time for some of the core competencies. So is really a one to five mope to dwell cycle still right for the Army National Guard? Are you considering moving away from this deployment cycle as it may not be sustainable in the long run, uh, particularly with some of the recurring domestic operations requiring a longer readiness cycle for some guard units? Yeah, that's a that's a great question. And what I what I like to remind people is is really we we currently exist in a a demand based system, meaning the enemy has a vote uh, and COVID-19 being an enemy. So that is, you know, op obviously driven up operational tempo and, and, and purse tempo. But generally, I will say, uh, having deployed four times myself as a as an Army Guardsman, that 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 one to five dwell time is about right. Uh, I, I think young men and young women join the Army National Guard in part to provide back to their local community, but also for that experience uh, to mobilize and deploy and contribute uh, globally uh, as well. And so what I talk to everybody about is our ability to prioritize uh, units and effort at any given time. And, and so, uh, you know, as we look at, at rearm and we're able to, to place our units uh, on a, five-year calendar, we can see where we really need to prioritize our unit as it relates to, to resources to include time. And during those times, we have to be very careful about uh, giving that, that unit too much to do. I, I will again draw on my personal experience. And so uh, I was the adjutant general in, in Minnesota and, and after the, the murder of George Floyd in Minneapolis, obviously we had a very contentious uh, security uh, environment at that point. Uh, prior to that, we had COVID-19 response. Uh, and 
we had our first brigade 34th infantry division who was getting ready to go to the national training center in the summer of 2020. So early on, as it related to COVID-19, I really protected that unit from any COVID-19 task because I wanted it to, to purely focus uh, on preparing for the CTC. And so I went to my other units in the state to meet the governor's uh, requirements as it related to the, to the Army National Guard. However, once we got into the civil unrest following the murder of George Floyd, I wasn't really able to prioritize that organization that way. And, and when the governor called for the full mobilization of the Minnesota Guard, we had to bring that unit uh, inbound. But because we had protected them from months and months and months of COVID duty, they had been able to get good enough uh, and get enough reps into being able to go to CTC. Uh, which was really important because one of those battalions from that brigade ended up being at H. Kaya uh, as, we, uh, as we withdrew from Afghanistan. And had they not had that CTC experience, had we not prioritized them uh, for that experience, I don't know that they would have been able to do the things that uh, our army and our nation needed them to do uh, in Afghanistan uh, later on. So that's why you know, we talk a lot about prioritizing our effort and our units and understanding what, what we've asked of them and what we're going to ask of them. So we can help tamp down a little bit of, uh, of what your friends talked to you about their, their experience with Optempo. So speaking a little bit about what it is that we ask of guardsmen, um, you know, there are a number of challenges to National Guard readiness that have the risk of exacerbating uh, future readiness, uh, readiness when we might actually need it to face some of the future challenges that we're expecting to see. And I want to ask you about a current one that I think is, you know, over time going to be a bigger and bigger issue. And this really has to do with sort of the social contract uh, that exists uh, between members of the Guard and their communities. And so there's a lot of difficulties that really come with almost maintaining two separate careers, a successful civilian career and a successful career in the Guard. Uh, you know, despite everything that's gotten thrown at the Guard over the past couple of years from domestic and overseas deployments, changes in force structure, you know, you name it, uh, the Guard has performed rather admirably and retention rates have actually remained fairly high. But you have to acknowledge that all of this has probably come at the cost to a number of members of the Guard and to their families. So I'm kind of curious as to what the Army National Guard is doing to improve well-being over time. Uh, and so thinking about ways in which perhaps the Guard is trying to reset the compact with their communities and with some of the civilian employers uh, that Guards members might have. Hey, Becca, that's a, that's a great question because that's the tension of, of having a reserve component that's an operational reserve. Uh, is that tension with with family, that tension with employer, uh, employers, and, and and you know from my perspective, uh, really the the unsung heroes of our nation for uh, since the you know post 9/11 era here has been our employers. Their their willingness to support our reserve component members regardless of service. You know I'm here as an Army Guardsman, uh, but but I'm talking about our Naval Reservists, our, our Marine Reservists. But our, our, our employers' uh, willingness to support reserve component service, I think, is unmatched in any other country uh, in, in the world. And where we see a lot of that stress is at that mid-grade level. And what, what I would say is, is, you know, you look at uh, a major. And when I was a, when I was a young major, it's like everybody who was a major, you know, you stuck around. Uh, for that promotion a lieutenant colonel with with that that hope and that wish that maybe you might be a battalion commander uh, nowadays we we don't necessarily always see that we see people as they enter their 20 year 20th year of service as a major you know not willing to, to stick it out for three or four more years to see if they're going to have that 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 opportunity uh, and so there is a lot of tension there and there is a lot of competition uh, there and not just in the officer ranks as well uh, you look at our nco ranks that 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 E5 transitioning to E6 and E6 transitioning to, to E7. The same thing, they're at that point in their life where they're 
where their kids are at that age of where they're very active in school and extracurricular activities. They're at that point of their civilian career where their civilian employer is beginning to ask, uh, you know, more and more uh, of them. And we understand that competition. So I think there's a couple of things that uh, we need to do and that, that we're focused on. First and foremost, I think it's one, we have a relevant mission in the reserve component. So, so the time that I am spending in the reserve component, I know that it's adding value. Uh, number two, that, that, you know, again, to Secretary Wormuth's comments about positive command climates, I, I belong to and I serve in a quality unit that's made up of quality people that is, that is, that is led by quality uh, leaders. And then I think the biggest piece, and this is kind of how I tried to operate in, in my command positions, is always understand where everybody is in terms of their own personal cycle. And we talk about life balance and there's, in my perspective, there's no life balance. It's more like a teeter totter. As you have to give more time in one area, you obviously are given less time in another area. And, and that changes you know, year to year, and in some cases, month, month to month. And so it's understanding where each, each one of our soldiers is at at a given time and not to ask them to do more uh, than what they can do. Uh, because it's about the future in many cases. You know, retention is about the future. Uh, and that's where our eye as leaders have to be. You know, we value education, we value training because it prepares us for the future. We value working with individual soldiers as a leader because it, it's, it's a, a value proposition into the future and not treat every single day as the most important day in the history of the United States Army. Uh, because we can't do that. We have to have an eye to the future and we have to have an eye towards retaining our soldiers, our families, and our employers. That's great to hear. And I look forward to seeing uh, the Army National Guard, you know, put some more teeth behind that, if you will. Um, before we shift to talking about future force structure and modernization, I just want to remind the audience to please keep your questions coming. I'm seeing some great ones already in the chat. Would love to see a bunch more, and I know the general would too. So please continue to use the Q&A function at the bottom of your screen. Okay, so let's go on to force structure. Um, so you alluded to some force structure changes that would potentially be in the offing. I know recently there's been this shift um, to provide eight divisions uh, from the guard for the total force. Um, I also think that there's uh, some, you know, sort of machinations behind the scenes to develop, uh, you know, new units that focus on things that are perhaps maybe a little bit more relevant to future warfare, whether this is sort of information operations and cyber operations. So can you talk about some of the future force structure changes we should expect to see, particularly as the Guard thinks about how it should organize for future conflict? Yeah, absolutely, Becca. So I think, you know, as, as we look out to the goal of, of a multi-domain capable and a multi-domain ready Army, obviously that has to include the Army Guard and the Army Reserve as well. And so the, the first thing and an initiative that was started by my predecessor, uh, now Chief of the National Guard Bureau, uh, General Dan Hokinson, was this idea and concept that as the Army moved away from brigade-centric organizations and we began to organize under divisions again, that the Army National Guard needed to do that as well. And so we've put a lot of effort into, into, that, into that movement. So much like the uh, Army, but probably, uh, probably a little bit different than the Army. We certainly had a brigade-centric focus in the Army Guard uh, through the, through the 2000s. And so realigning our brigades uh, under divisions has been a, a focus. And, and, and I'm, I'm very, very happy with that, uh, that alignment and where we're at. Uh, very, uh, very positive feedback uh, from our senior leaders across the force and understanding that first and foremost, we have to look like and organize like the army. So the second piece is it relates to uh, that division alignment then is, is looking at what key enablers for the division do we need that currently don't exist. I'll give you, I'll give you two examples. Uh, the division artillery. The division artillery was an artillery command that existed uh, when we were previously organized uh, in a division-centric army. When we became brigade-centric, 
that uh, level of command went away. We have now began to stand up division uh, artillery commands again uh, inside of the Army National Guard because of their primary focus as a division fire center for division headquarters. Uh, so that's kind of maybe going back to the past a little bit, going strictly to the future information and electronic warfare battalions, a key enabler for all of our divisions as it relates to our ability to conduct operations in a multi-domain uh, environment. New force structure that we're, we're bringing on again to uh, support that division headquarters. Uh, the last one I'll give you is, is uh, you know, more of an equipment based one here. Uh, extend, extended range cannon artillery, ERC A, beginning to transition some of, we've identified our formations that we're going to uh, begin to transition to that ERC A capability to really help the Army meet that long range precision fires requirement that they have uh, in support of the joint force. And so all, all of this is looking at what are our historic and current missions, and then what needs to be converted that we can convert the field artillery as an example, and what do we, stand, what do we need to stand up from new, the division artillery uh, as an example of that. So we're very excited uh, about uh, the future and where we're going as a Army National Guard while maintaining that key combat arms reserve for the United States Army. So you've talked about some of those major changes, but even on sort of a smaller scale, it strikes me that there, per, there are perhaps some things that uh, you could do to help at least maybe some maneuver units uh, prepare for future conflict in a contested C4 ISR environment. You know, this could potentially entail rewriting some of the mission essential task lists. My understanding is that a lot of them are actually designed to support some outdated concepts that you would potentially see in World War II, but aren't necessarily going to, uh, you know, focus on the missions that these units should prioritize and will actually face. Is that something that's on your radar? Oh, absolutely. And so, you know, you know, we, we call the dot mill PFP approach to, 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 to this. And so we, we, we create a, uh, a joint force warfare concept. Uh, we then create the army uh, concept that supports the joint force concept. And then inside of that, we have to look at every aspect. We have to look at, you know, doctrinally what needs to change? Uh, how do our organizations need to change? How does our training need to take uh, change as it relates to, to all of that? And so uh, I wouldn't say necessarily it's metal task. So as an infantryman, I will tell you, uh, you know, a key metal task is my ability to conduct a movement to contact or react to contact uh, with the enemy. But what I have now is I have new enabling capabilities that allows me to see the enemy earlier and at greater distance. And so my movement to contact, uh, I am maybe using def different weapon systems to uh, engage the enemy and uh, to sense the enemy. So the task is going to change. Maybe the, the title of that mission essential task isn't going to change. So let's move on to talking a little bit about modernization. You talked a little bit about ERC A and some of the other capabilities. I know that guard units, uh, you know, have integrated JLTV. I think there are some units that are slated to field M Shorad. Um, you know, what else should we expect to see? I'm thinking about some of the Army Futures Command uh, cross-functional teams. You know, so should we expect to see future vertical lift, future long-range assault aircraft? What is it that the that guard units need to meet the demands of future warfare? Yeah, Becca, I mean, we are fully engaged with Army Futures Command at the cross-functional team level because it, it, it's very, very important that uh, that as a reserve component, we, we're we're a partner uh, at the at the table uh, because as as you mentioned you know our our soldiers as a traditional force uh, are are going to very well have to become experts on new weapon systems and new capabilities but not be able to do, do that on a on a day-to-day -day basis so how do we how do we make this achievable and approachable for a reserve component and and I will tell you I as the director of the army guard I'm looking at every new capability that the army is developing and trying to find a role for the Army National Guard. So let's talk about multi-domain task force. The MDTF, 
uh, is, uh, is a key enabling headquarters as it relates to multi-domain operations. Well, I believe there's a role for the Army Guard inside a MDTF. And so uh, analyzing uh, the requirements of that formation, understanding really what uh, that formation is going to provide the warfighter, uh, and then determining how we can contribute to that effort is, is very, very important. Uh, let's, take, uh, let's take cyber for an example. Uh, our traditional guardsmen bring tremendous amount of uh, privately developed uh, cyber capability through their employer. They come to uh, U.S. Army Cyber Command with, with a different set of, of skills and, and in some cases a more enhanced set of skills as it relates to, 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 to that mission. I think there's great potential to grow cyber capability uh, into the uh, Army National Guard. And so again, it's, you know, as we view ourselves as, the, as, a, as a key combat reserve, as the key combat reserve of the United States Army, it's looking at the whole suite of those missions uh, and then really looking at how we can uh, convert if necessary transition if necessary or stand up brand new units uh if necessary if necessary and so you know what i've what i've told the, the g3 of the army is is hey we're here to help solve problems of the army please just give us a chance to do that so let me push you on that just a little bit because i hear you talking about ways in which you can get the national guard as a primary reserve component of the army to fit into some of those army modernization priorities but is it possible that some of the modernization priorities for the Guard actually differ from uh, active duty Army? Uh, you know, you can think that about what the active force is trying to do. And yes, the National Guard does play a role in a lot of that and does have responsibilities. But it has, unlike the active Army, it has both Title 10 and Title 32 responsibilities. So you could imagine that perhaps there could be some modernization priorities that actually sort of more fulfill uh, the domestic functions that the Guard needs to uh, you know, undertake. So can you talk about whether there's any tension there or whether there's at least thought to whether um, modernization priorities should differ slightly? Well, I. I I think you raise a, a really good point. So let's let me compare and contrast, you know, a general purpose force with with cyber. You know, I just mentioned the great capability the Army Guard brings to uh, cyber, and there's a great appetite to grow cyber capability, uh, you know, in DoD and the Department of the Army, and I will tell you by our governors as well, the ability to defend, you know, key uh, key networks uh, in the state. But not everybody can be a cyber warrior. Right. So we are also going to need that general purpose force that, uh, for example, drives trucks uh, and maintains equipment. Uh, that requirement's never going to go away. Now, we might in some in some day in the future, we might uh, move to completely autonomous vehicles where you don't need a driver. But we're going to need that maintainer to maintain uh, that fleet. And in many cases, if you look at it, if we no longer need drivers and assistant drivers for that vehicle, we very well might be able to port, put more vehicles in a traditional transportation company, thus increasing our need for uh, maintainers for that piece of equipment. So I think I think what you're getting to, Becca, is right on. We need a nice balance of, of forces across the Army National Guard between general purpose and specialized forces. Uh, and that, that allows a great array of forces for our senior DOD leadership, our senior Army leadership, and then also our senior state leadership to pick from and employ uh, in accordance with a, with a requirement. So one last question for me before we shift to questions from the audience. Uh, so, you know, I'll keep it brief. Uh, hopefully you can too. But I want to talk about resources, right? Right now, the National Guard is being called upon to do everything and anything. And if that trajectory holds, you know, the, the Guard is going to need to fund a lot of important priorities and changes, many of which you've mentioned today. You know, resources are finite, uh, particularly when you're trying to balance modernization, readiness, or structure. So of the three, what's going to give? Are you considering cutting end strength to support modernization objectives? What's kind of your theory behind that? 
Well, the, it, yeah, it's 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 no secret that there's budget tensions uh, here in D.C. Uh, for 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 sure, and and obviously that's going to cascade down to the reserve component as well. And and so what we're doing uh, as it relates to you know current year 22, uh, as we await a presidential budget for 23, and as we work on Palm 24, 28, is really to work with the Army and 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 ask this question. What is it that you need and when is it that you need it? And so we look at modernization sometimes, I think like we're gonna do it right now. Well, it's gonna, we've started it, but really the, I think the two uh, key gates as it relates to army modernizations, 2030 and 2040. So I really believe my job right now as the director of the army guard is to shape the army guard for that modernization into 2030, and then that follow-on modernization post 2030 uh, into 2040. General McConville has been very adamant that the reserve component's not gonna be at the back of the line as it relates to modernization, that we're gonna simultaneously do COMPO one, two, and three. Now, I mentioned uh, end strength and the importance of end strength uh, to the Army Guard. I would never advocate for a cut, a cutting of the end strength of the Army National Guard. I believe uh, that we can maintain a large Army National Guard as a reserve to the United States Army and that we need to. Uh, and, that, and that as the Army balances that modernization, readiness, and strength decisions that we have, that we can fill in where they're not able to fill in. So if it is, for example, if it is readiness, uh, I can make for a little bit cheaper price, more Army Guard units, more ready to maybe pick up some of that uh, early deploying unit uh, responsibility. If it's end strength, maybe I can move some of that capability that the Army needs to move out of end strength uh, from their end strength into the Army Guard. So again, I think it's uh, we're going to we're going to work with the Army and we're going to we're going to fill that gap where they need us to fill that gap along those three efforts. Okay, let's start off with some questions from the audience. Uh, this one from Steve. Are there any updates uh, with any planning on creating a space National Guard? Uh, I know that there have been uh, Army National Guard members who have actually ended up uh, working on some space issues. So I'm wondering if you have any update on whether there's consideration for a space, space National Guard. Uh, absolutely. In the in the National Guard, uh, our chief, uh, General Hokinson, this is one of his priorities, is, is taking uh, those capabilities that primarily exist in our Air National Guard uh, and, and, and creating that space National Guard capability in, inside of the National Guard. We think it's very, very important when you look at the historic role and function and mission uh, in space that our Air National Guard has has played, uh, we think it's uh, we think it's a natural progression of that force, because the alternative is is that mission goes away, and in all of that experience and all of that investment that we've made into space operations inside of our Air National Guard will go away, and we just don't think that that's uh, that's right. Now we're not advocating for a space National Guard in all fifty states three territories in the district, but where that capability current exists, we believe that they uh, should be part of a space national guard. So thanks for that question, Steve. And so another question from Mark, um, you know, we talked a little bit about uh, some of the natural disasters before, but I think Mark's question gets at this even more. With the publication of the Pentagon's climate strategy, what are some of the short, medium, and long-term actions we can be watching for with the Army National Guard? Yeah, I think, uh, you know, we, we're still working through the, that strategy, but I think there's a, there's a couple things that we have been working on previous to that strategy. So let's just talk about becoming more energy uh, resilient. Uh, I think the Secretary of the Army mentioned, you know, all, all of the solar pa panel fields that exist. We simultaneously have been doing the same thing inside of many of our National Guard installations. Again, uh, as a Minnesotan, I could point to uh, the, the, the great environmental things uh, that we're doing as, uh, as it relates to uh, Camp Ripley and, and the solar uh, piece there. But it was also to gain uh, energy and independence as well uh, as it relates to that. 
Uh, many of our northern tier states have been involved in an Arctic work group uh, for almost 10 years now. Uh, as, we, as we look at the importance of the uh, Arctic for our Army National Guard, our ability to operate uh, in, in, th in the Arctic. Uh, again, a, a, one of our key allies and a, and a key partnership, uh, the country of Norway, uh, the, the Minnesota National Guard and the uh, Norwegian Home Guard have a over 50 year partnership, uh, mill to mill. And, and, and really the Norwegians have, have identified and talked about this for significantly longer than, than, than we have. Uh, but, but understanding uh, those key partnerships in the Arctic and how we can contribute to those partnerships, I think is, is really important. So whether it's the climate or, or the Arctic, I, I, I think uh, we'll, we'll continue to look for ways to contribute to the Army uh, and to our, our nation. So a question from another Mark, this is a Mark with a C rather than a K. Um, how do we anticipate and train for new challenges and adaptation? Does this require more medical training, forest, fighter, forest firefighting, civil unrest, MPs type training? What's needed? Yeah, I think first and foremost, you have to, be, you have to understand your core competence, what your core mission is. And, and, and so the way I was kind of brought up uh, as, a, as a young soldier, a young NCO and a young officer was this, this idea that if you train for the most complex mission, uh, you will be able to do something less complex than that. So again, that's why we truly believe that what prepares us to do our mission here domestically is, is preparing for the, for the war fight. And, and I will use again, our experience in Minnesota as it relates to uh, the, the civil unrest after the murder of George Floyd. What allowed our units at, at no notice to uh, respond to that event uh, and support our law enforcement agencies in that event really without incident was the experience and discipline, uh, the leadership, the mission command uh, that they had developed over years and years of deployment and preparing for deployment. So I think our approach, especially in a component where, where time is of, is of the essence, is be a master of the basics, be a master of your core competencies, and that will allow you to, to flex where you need to flex. So we have a question from Carlos, and you talked a lot about people as being a very important pillar of where the Army National Guard is going in the future. And so Carlos asks, what actions is the Army National Guard taking to ensure that the composition of the Guard better reflects the face of America with respect to representation of minorities? Um, and how is it that you are trying to make sure that the Guard actually reflects what America truly looks like? Yeah, uh, Carlos, I, I appreciate that question. This is really, I think, uh, you know, a key, it should be a key focus for all the leadership of the Army National Guard, and and I and I think that you know, we we are a very diverse organization in part because we come from our communities, but I think there are deliberate decisions that we sometimes make in the it, it, as a senior leader that may not always set us up to be as successful as we can, uh, and and that is, for example. Where, where are we putting our key facilities? Are we putting them in communities to, uh, that will help us attract a more diverse uh, recruiting pool? Or are we putting our facilities in an area uh, that uh, will not uh, attract as, as a diverse area? So we work very closely uh, with all of our adjutants general. Uh, the chief of the National Guard Bureau has a, a joint diversity executive council uh, that meets very regularly. Uh, we have a uh, diversity and inclusion equity uh, uh, staff branch here that helps us uh, with this. And, and I can tell you that there's a tremendous amount of focus uh, of this. And it's all about this. This is, you know, my approach has always been this. What we provide is opportunity. And we, we need to ensure that we are providing our opportunity to the greatest number of people as we can. Uh, and so uh, in the Army Guard, one of the ways that we do that is, for example, um, in Minnesota, is there's a lot of tension about our armories that are, that are away from our very large population-based uh, cities, um, and that we should locate just strictly in our large population bases. But, but 
we then deny our people from our, our, our citizens in the out state that opportunity to become really a member. So it's all about, from my aspect, it, it's, it's all about uh, opportunity. And then it's creating that positive command climate that really values our soldiers. And it recognizes that as a leader, my responsibility is to assist my soldiers to get to their full potential. Uh, and so those are those are some things I think at the unit level that we're really trying to put a lot of focus on. Meanwhile, here at the strategic level uh, with the chief is to talk about the importance of diversity, to recognize the importance of that uh, and continue to expand opportunities uh, to all of our citizens uh, in the United States. And so as we look at how do you change recruiting, for example, uh, I think one of the things that we have to do is we have to look at every single one of our enlistment criteria and ask ourselves, is this criteria still valid? Uh, and if not, then let's get rid of it. So if, if we determine that the ASVAB test uh, is a key obstacle uh, for some of our citizens becoming soldiers in the active component or the reserve component, let's take a look at that and let's make changes where where we need to make changes. Because what we really want to do is we want to provide this opportunity uh, to the, the, the greatest segment of our population as we, as we can. So I have a question here from Steve about extremism in the ranks and how that is going to affect the Army National Guard moving forward. He points out that there have been uh, several guardsmen who were part of uh, you know, storming the Capitol on January 6th that have not been removed uh, from the Guard. Um, and he asks, um, you know, do these actions reflect the Army values and does their cont continued service reflect the military's efforts to combat extremism? What is the Army National Guard doing to combat extremism within its ranks? Well, I, I think it's very obvious that extremism does not match the, the Army values. I, I, I think that's a, that's a very easy answer as it relates to that. And, and as it relates to any particular case, as it relates to Army National Guard members and their participation uh, uh, on January 6th. You know, I'd really have to defer that to each one of those adjutants general uh, that, that are responsible for, for those decisions. Uh, and, and so whether, you know, they're waiting for that case to be adjudicated legally uh, or, or what their decision-making process as it relates to that, I'd have to really defer uh, to, to them. But, but I can tell you that we take uh, extremism uh, very serious uh, inside of the National Guard. And, and, and we do truly want to have an organization that reflects, uh, you know, the diversity and the inclusion uh, that we really believe that the Army value leads us, uh, leads us to, and that there's no place for uh, extremism inside of our ranks. Great. And so hopefully there will be some programming to reduce some of the propensity towards that as we move into the future. Uh, so I think we are running short on time. Um, and after that tough question, I want to ask you one very easy one, which is I understand that you are a bourbon aficionado. I am a bit partial to whiskey myself. Uh, but if I was starting out, what would be your recommendation for a bourbon that I had to try and that everyone who's tuning in? And should definitely uh, grab a bottle of. Uh, aficionado is probably uh, too technical of a term for, for me. So I, I will tell you uh, first, uh, always enjoy it in moderation. That's, that's the key part, right? Uh, uh, and then two other points as it relates to this. Uh, number one, drink the whiskey that you like. Uh, that's always key. And then what I have found is my favorite whiskey is always somebody else's whiskey. Uh, so ensuring that I don't violate, uh, uh, you know, an endorsement of a non-federal entity, I will tell you that other people's whiskey is the best whiskey. Well, General, I will hold you to that next time I see you. Um, so, General Jensen, thank you so much for a fantastic discussion about the future of the Army National Guard. I think you've given us a lot to think about, um, and I look forward to seeing some of these changes being implemented over time. Uh, to the audience, thank you so much for joining us today, and I'm sorry if I didn't have a chance to get to your question. I promise that I will definitely do better next time to get to it. So we're going to have some more Mission Brief events. So stay tuned from us and that until next time, folks.